Good evening and welcome to the Peccadillo Sofa Club. My name is Mark Thompson and I'm your host this evening where we're going to be discussing the most beautiful boy in the world, a wonderful film which reflects on the cast of Death in Venice. This hour's conversation, this evening's conversation will run for about an hour and I have two amazing guests who are going to be joining me to discuss the themes of the film, some of the issues that it raises and then to have some questions from you, the audience. So first of all, I'd like to introduce my first guest this evening, Dr. Aaron Ballack. Alan Aaron is a psychotherapist, consultant, cultural theorist and author, drawing on more than 20 years of clinical and academic experience. Aaron is a leading voice in the public understanding of psychology and how it can di directly be applied, sorry, and how it can be directly applied to benefit individuals and society and organizations. He's the author of The Psychodynamics of Social Networking and The Little Book of Calm and Keep Your Call for Children. It's lovely to see you this evening, Aaron. And hey, well, my next guest this evening is Hugh Lemmy. Hugh is a novelist and artist and critic living in Barcelona. He's the author of four books, including Unknown Language and Bad Gays and Homosexual History, based off the popular podcast of the same names. He writes on sex, culture, history and cities for numerous magazines and journals, including The Freeze and Architectural Review. As an artist and filmmaker, his work has appeared at numerous international institutions, and his first film, Ungentle, explores a complicated relationship between gay men and security services in 20th century Britain. Welcome, Hugh. It's lovely to see you today. Thanks, Mark. So, we're going to show you some trailers from the film and some various clips, and then us guys are going to get that together. We're going to have a conversation. So we hope you sit back and you enjoy what we're about to do. And um, we'll show you the trailer. Daju! Daju! Quel âge a-t-il? Il est très beau. Dis-lui d'enlever son boulot. Det känns som svärmar av flammlös omkring. Du är bara en levande mardröm. Så nu är det en kacke som är det. Det är ganska. Det var den peak av din popularitet. Och jag ville vara någonstans där och vara någon annan. Jag blev väl mer eller mindre vätskrämd. Jag hade ju inga föräldrar egentligen. Ja, det var ju liksom mormor som styrde de här grejerna. Hon ville ha en kändis som barnbarn. Du är ingen enkel människa, Björn. Min stora kärlek. Förtjänar du? Ce fut un rôle quasi euh, mythique, peu le symbole, j'allais dire, de la beauté masculine. Återstår en dörr. Kanske vaknar jag åter. Då ska jag komma tillbaka och leta efter dig. Like you know, to put the, put the eyes on the beauty is to put the eyes on the death. So, the most beautiful boy in the world. So, both of you, first of all, have you seen Death in Venice? Aaron, tell me a little bit about your view of that. Uh, well, I watched it many years ago and uh, I rewatched it after watching the documentary and uh, I didn't like it any more than I did the first time. <laughs> and my, my kind of conclusion is um, it's a very long movie it's a very short book and you could actually read the book in the time it takes to watch the movie. <laughs> and I know we kind of don't, we shouldn't really be comparing books to movies and, you know, they're, they're, they're different beasts, but actually the short book, there's almost a kind of perfection to it. And I don't really see so much the value that the film brings to it. I know a lot of people disagree with that, but that, that's kind of how I feel about it. And Hugh, you've read the book and you've seen the film. So what are your views about the original film, Death in Venice? 
Yeah, I'd agree to an extent. You can really see how um, Visconti is sort of um, becomes obsessed with the book and um, allows it to sort of take over his 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 life. And when it when it when he realizes it, eventually it sort of fits into this this his sort of wider milieu of uh, of his oeuvre. Sorry, of um, these sort of quite sprawling tales of like the um, opulence and intensity of um, bourgeois life in in Europe. Um, but uh, I think I'd agree. At some point, it seems to sort of uh, balloon a bit too much take over and um uh there's like a, a like a level of uh, the richness and intensity in which um uh, thomas mann's book kind of gets lost a little bit at times um some of the sharpness of the of the book and um uh, the the punchiness i guess of the of the story that it tells can can sort of disappear sometimes behind the film and your thoughts on the documentary um, Aaron, I mean, I, I watched it a couple of weeks ago and I, I found it at parts moving, sometimes quite shocking and upsetting, but also some beautiful moments in it. What, what were your thoughts upon seeing it? Well, first of all, it was really uh, educative to me. I had no idea about the history of Bjorn and what he'd been through. And uh, What's so sad about it, I think, from my perspective, like the you know, as a psychologist, is is that this this poor guy just gets continually objectified, you know, like first by family members, then by the directors, then by kind of the whole of a culture. And that in fact, there's a real resilience there that's really touching and that you see it in parts. Um but you also see the kind of brokenness, which isn't just about the film. It kind of goes back before the film. Mm. Um, but yeah, just the essence of this guy who's, who's already so vulnerable, so vulnerable when he showed up for that screening. And then what I think we can safely call, you know, an abusive situation that takes off from then on and then rolls on forward. It's, it's really quite heartbreaking. And you, you, Hugh, you've seen it, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it offers a really amazing counterpoint to the film itself um, because um what's what's so attractive about Visconti which is like I said this this aesthetic richness um um and uh, this eye for the these sort of visual details is it's sort of cut a little bit by by this film which offers the sort of stark truth there's an aestheticization constantly of the the artist's vision as in as you see in sort of um Aschenbach's telling of the story as well and when you see this film you see um it kind of feels like the 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 uh he's been cast for life almost Bjorn and, and in, in his life you actually see the the consequences of exactly the sort of objectification that Ashenbach is play, playing on Tadjo in the film like this is the results of the way that if you ch- treat children objectify children in this way and put them in these abusive situations um as Ashenbach does then the results is kind of what you see in Bjorn's life so I think it's a it's a really interesting um, corrective to the film in some ways. And um, yeah, I think it's probably vital viewing for anyone who's really interested in, in um, Visconti's film is to watch this afterwards. And because I don't think it's just an interesting documentary about his life. I think it says something about the way Visconti works. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we're now actually going to start diving into the film itself. And so we're going to show a series of clips from each of the films and come back and kind of reflect on the clips and some of the wider discussion points and themes that they bring up. So if we can show the second, the first clip, please. Un rituel vieux de 25 ans déjà. Tenue de soirée et sourire de rigueur, les photographes accueillent les célébrités du cinéma. Du jury au 25e festival, accompagné de Lucino Visconti. Énorme qui se presse aux abords du palais du festival. Car ce soir, c'est la première soirée du Festival du Film. Den, den verkliga orkanen så att säga tog väl fart från Cannesfestivalen och framåt. Det var där den verkliga cirkusen började. Mais le Cuno Visconti est comme presque toujours un des favoris officiels avec la mort à venir. Une lumière dans les yeux, je ne vois pas monsieur. Voilà, maintenant c'est mieux. C'est un contre l'outil, c'est pas mal. Question, question. Euh, je peux vous en poser une, Lucino Visconti, parce que j'en ai Alors quelques-unes. Je peux vous en poser une si on ne vous en oui, pose pas. Oui, naturellement. Entendu. Tout le monde connaît l'immense talent de Dirk Bogart, c'est donc inutile de le souligner une fois de plus. 
Mais on ne connaît pas bien Bjorn Andresen. Pourriez-vous nous dire comment vous l'avez découvert Je vous raconte toute l'histoire de Bjorn Andresen, s'il me le permet. Il ne comprend pas le français très bien, mais enfin, il sait. Euh, et je suis arrivé à Stockholm le premier jour où j'ai commencé à visionner les garçons euh, suédois. Le cinquième, je dis le cinquième qui est entré dans la chambre, était M. Bjorn Andersen. Et moi, j'étais sûr que c'était lui, Tatsu. Je n'ai pas eu de doute. J'ai commencé à le photographier de la tête aux pieds, de tous les côtés, hein, tout de la priori même. <rire> Tatsu trouvé. Il était plus beau que ça, hein, parce qu'il a, il a, il a vieilli maintenant. Il est, il est un peu trop grand, il a les cheveux trop longs. Enfin, il était beaucoup plus beau à ce moment-là. Il ne le sait pas, mais il est en train de changer. Peut-être que ça sera un très beau, bel homme, mais pour le moment, bon. C'est l'âge ingrat, c'est l'âge ingrat. Il a maintenant 15 ans, 16, 16. Il est très vieux. I don't know about you two, but when I first watched that clip, I found that deeply uncomfortable, the bit about he's too old now at 16. And what were your thoughts when you saw that in, in, in the full film and seeing it again now? Um, I'll go to you first, Aaron. I think that there's like this one piece of truth in that whole thing about the age, which I think is a mistake of the whole Death in Venice film. I think that Death in Venice, the book, is actually about youth and aging. It's not really about physical beauty, right? And somehow it all gets reduced to that. And his remark about he's he's too old now at 15, it's actually the essence of the book, right? But it, it slips out almost like a Freudian slip where everybody's obsessed with the the aesthetics of youth. And... I, don't, I won't go on too much, but like in, in the book, Tadzio is almost like a part of the imagination of Aschenbach. He's not like, he's not, I'm, I'm not even sure how real he is. And there's some elements of that in the film. I don't know. There's so much I could say. It's so distressing and uncomfortable with him, but the obsession with youth aesthetic when it's not even really what it's about, I think really comes across in that clip also. Mm -hmm. And Hugh, your thoughts? I'm going to come back to the youth aesthetic in a minute as well, Aaron. But, but your thoughts, uh, Hugh? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like in the book, he's, he's quite clear that actually the sort of um, the purpose of Tadjo is to function as some, some relationship to death. Like it's called Death in Venice. And they do mention it actually in the, in the documentary that he's supposed to be this sort of harbinger of death, an angel of death. Mm. And you see that in the book, like the way he describes him. He is beautiful the way he describes him in the book. He's clearly supposed to be beautiful. But he also describes him as sort of choler um, choleric, you know, that he's got cholera. That his teeth are sort of um, ugly and falling apart, and so and that's completely obviously whitewashed in this um, in this uh, in the, in the, the film. Um, and I think also um, seeing this moment as it as it happens in front of the cameras, and and then hearing Bjorn now reflect upon it as this moment where beforehand in the production he's really protected in by Visconti in this quite quite difficult way but from from the rest of the world like Visconti has to sort of keep him pure and no to he says at one point I think that the the all the crew were, were homosexual but no one was allowed to mm. even look so much as look at him um that he wanted to sort of keep him untarnished as this like image of um innocence I guess and then at this this film festival um there's like a quite a clear moment Bjorn remembers where he's sort of thrown to the dogs where Visconti is like, okay, you've you've done your bit now. Um, uh, let 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 everyone have you. And then he, as he says in that thing, like that's that's the the can was really the moment when the circus began and, and his life really sort of, uh, yeah, really started to get a lot more difficult. Um, which I think is interesting in relation to how he made the film. Mm. I'm going to come to you, Aaron, in a minute about kind of fame and the impact that would have on somebody so young. But Hugh, I just want to kind of just stick with you on that question around youth and the aesthetic of youth and how that sits within queer culture and and art and do you have a view on why that is and why it's so important and why it happens so often yeah well you start to see in the late 19th century um these sort of twin movements sort of arising of um of what homosexuality homosexuality might be obviously but there's always been people men who desire men um, but it starts to emerge as something with a name in the end of the 19th century, uh, in Germany especially, and also in, in the United Kingdom. And in that process, there's these two twin movements, one of which is a sort of pathologic, pathologizing movement of medicalization, 
where doctors get together and say there's this type of person who does this and we think it's some sort of sickness or something innate in their in who they are um, and at the same time you see a sort of cultural movement of poets um, and a people called uranians which is sort of like a movement of poetry and they were starting to look for um look at this as like a positive thing as something they want to self-identify with and the way they did that was actually quite often through looking back at classical classical models like the the ancient greeks and the romans and um Although Thomas Mann, I don't think, would ever have defined himself within that sort of strand in Death in Venice, he makes m a lot of similar arguments. He constantly is referring back to, to Plato, for example, in the symposium and these sort of discussions of this model of same-sex activity that was somehow, uh, for, first of all, acceptable, and second of all, perhaps superior, um, like a more important, um, more beautiful form of love. Um, and that was pederastic in the Greek society. It was um, older men who took younger younger boys, uh, sort of pubescent boys, teenagers, mm. and there was a sexual aspect to a relationship that was also based around education. And um, uh, that formed a, a sort of role, a function in that society, which obviously we can still look back on and, and recognize as, as, as abusive. But at the, the time in the late 19th, early 20th century, men were sort of looking back on this as perhaps a positive thing they wanted to reclaim and the, the discourses that we perhaps have now about childhood sexual abuse uh, weren't so uh, mainstream or ingrained the, those sort of discussions weren't happening and so I think yeah the the, the image of youth and this youthful aspect of, of um, uh, or this, the, the aspect of youth and beauty within homosexual desire in the early 20th century is very much based around these quite unequal relationships um, of power and age um, and that's, a, again, a big, big strand of what sort of man is wrestling with in, in Death in Venice, which were feelings that he was wrestling with himself, which is why he, he wrote the book. There, is, there, is, there was a real Tadzio he saw in Venice, and he, these desires in some ways are projections of his own desires towards that, that real young man who was, I think, a similar age, 13 or 14 at the time. Aaron, do you have any additional, any additional thoughts on that at all? I mean that was a that was a really comprehensive um, <laughs> history of the of the the view. So probably not not to add to that. No, no. So what I do want to ask you about, Aaron, and I've only got like a couple of minutes for this one, but we can see in that scene he's you know sixteen, he's thrust into this media spotlight, and you can see from that clip he looks deeply, well, from my view, really uncomfortable. What do you think the impact of that kind of thrust into fame has? And I think it plays out in the documentary. But just tell us what what does that do? Yeah, so we're kind of back to the objectification thing again. So if, if you're going to be an actor, if you're going to be a celebrity of any sort, even if it's going to be on TikTok, you're going to be objectified, right? It's kind of the point. You create an identity which is popularly consumed and, and that's it. And actually, even, you know, the most healthy of personalities struggle with big, big fame because of what it kind of draws on you. And what we learned from the documentary is that he stumbles onto the stage, probably not because he really wants to in the first place, probably because he's already being objectified by his grandmother who wants to achieve some kind of something through this boy who's already lost his mother. So we don't even really have consent here. And I think that's really what what's what, probably really the most damaging for him. I mean, I don't know anything about his personal story, but you know, we're already being objectified in a family situation and then you get thrown onto the global stage and you're objectified also for things that you're not, you know, the whole sort of gay world, for example, you know, looking at this as a as a one of the early portrayals of, you know, homosexuality in some kind of a way on the screen. Um, the whole thing that was going on in Japan, all of these, the ways mm -hmm. in which he was being viewed completely unfamiliar to how he would have experienced himself, which causes a great big split in the self and fundamentally can make you doubt that you're lovable for who you are or even know who that original part of you was okay thank you both very much so we're going to move on to another clip and then we'll come back for uh, another quick chat ska dörren öppnas en pojke som står där bakom vet ännu inte att för alltid ska hans värld vara förändrad hans ansikte brännas in som en ikon över hela världen Thank 
30 ans, c'est vieux. Oui. Quel âge a-t-il Il est très grand, hein Oui, un peu, il a 15. De taille, 15 ans, tu vois. Oui. Il est très beau, tourne la tête. Bien, bien profil, bien profil. Très. Um... Très beau dans la photo, j'ai vu. Ah oui, tu as des photos ici Come alto, ammazza. È bello, eh? Di lui da dove sono un culo nero. Mi trovo di più, mi trovo di più, ecco. Mi trovo di più, ecco. Mi trovo di più, ecco. Devo dalla camera, sì. Così ti fai con, eh? Cool. So when I first watched that clip, what really struck me, when I first watched that in the film and saw that clip, what really struck me was uh, the Shanti going across all of Northern Europe and finding these beautiful boys. Now, admittedly, the film is set in Venice in, you know, the, 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 the late 19th century. So that kind of makes sense. But what struck me was this definition of beauty. So Hugh, I want to come to you and just kind of un unpick a little bit about who defines beauty? Ah, the eye of the beholder, in this case, <laughs> especially, you know. You see him creating him as a beautiful boy before him. He's a, when You can see in, in uh, Bjorn's face almost that he sees himself as a 15-year-old boy. And he's put in front of this man who starts to define him with all these words and sort of explain to him that he's beautiful. And you see how uncomfortable and, and, and nervous he is about this. But in the act of describing him like that, he sort of takes all that power away from Bjorn to be who he is. Uh, it's like a kind of a, a quite a brutal process of, of like ownership in describing him as beautiful. Actually, it really reminded me of this film by William E. Jones, a short film called um, The Fall of Communism as Seen in Gay Pornography, which is a short film made up of casting clips from casting from gay porn films from the um, late 80s and early 90s, um, where he's um, he's just taking all these clips and putting them together. And they're just footage of these boys who are or young men in this case, who are, who are of, of legal age and theoretically have consented to this process of taking part in gay pornography. But actually the power differential, the power discrepancy is so great because these are young men sort of living through um, the collapse of their society, um, you know, all their social, uh, the, the, the structure of their society is falling apart, they're unemployed, life's very difficult for them. And someone comes in with a huge amount of money and says, um, do this and, you know, you'll, you'll get all this cash they desperately need and they have no real say in this. And in doing so, he's putting, he's putting the, you see them in these situations where they're clearly uncomfortable, but they can't say no because they, they don't know what there is that they're consenting to in a way. They don't have the, these sort of films in that society um, and they can't, yeah, they can't really say no. And in it, you see sort of um, the horror and it, almost over the, in their face and their eyes and then to the person who's casting them and quite often having sex with them or touching them, you see this sort of, um, yeah, this, it's like this very painful, horrible sort of thing to, to see this, this power differential and how they're objectified in that way. I think you see the same thing here. Um, and what's really remarkable is just, um, you know, that he barely talks to, to Bjorn himself. He's, mm. he passes, he, he, there's a translation, translation issue there as well. But this guy, this, this boy is kind of, um, who he is as a person is entirely separated from this image of him. Um, and that, that, that Visconti is sort of taking and using for his own rights. And he says later that he sort of owns his face for three years, legally, contractually, he owns his image for three years, um, which must be just so disconcerting for, for a boy of that age, because it says there that his life changed. But in some ways, he didn't have a fixed position anyway that he was coming from. And, and that's, mm. that's also very striking is that he, 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 he finds him at the point where he's at his most vulnerable anyway, that he doesn't, it's not like he's coming from one world and moving to another world. It's that he's already in this flow. And this is just one more person in this flow, as Aaron was saying, who decides to objectify him and then exploit him. But on this case, he's like exploiting on the world stage to such a massive degree that, uh, yeah, it must be a, a, a terrifying experience for him. And what I found interesting as well was when you're thinking about beauty standards, you're obviously thinking about European beauty standards, right? And you've also said early on, Hugh, around kind of reflecting back to the classical period and classical mm. youth, how that all fed in. What I think was quite interesting, this is for both of you really, is that when he gets to Japan and he becomes this right. pop idol and he becomes an anime character, they become female. In that as well, and I, I thought it was interesting. Do you have any kind of thoughts on on, on that at all, Aaron? What? Or, um, go go ahead, you. 
No, I think maybe that also goes back, as, we, as I was saying earlier about this, this classical model. Um, one aspect of this classical model is, of course, sort of like passivity and um, uh, the active and dominant partners or the, 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 the tops and bottoms, let's call it. And the, the sort of um, power roles that were built into that, which in the 19th century men were looking at and adopting and seeing how that, that was reflected again in, in this idea of beauty. And so there's a, it's gendered in a way. But then also, as you as you mentioned, it's it's massively racialized, um, and it's very interesting in the film seeing the way that he was sort of um, again repackaged um, in Japan, um, completely voiceless still, but became this sort of subject of a, an obsession or became an idol based upon uh, his almost his racial type rather than anything to do with um, yeah again his his him, him as a him as a person and how that yeah that continued through the years, and I was, I was amazed that he the, the, those. Uh, anime characters manga characters are still still sort of in use today 50 years on yeah i thought that was a that was stunning aaron Can, yeah i just wanted to pick up on, on something that you said earlier about the the other film that how it had this like porn aesthetic to it and that in the film that you mentioned hugh you could see the horror in the eyes i mm. would i would suggest people who who want to try this that go to that scene in the film and if you if you're able to watch it in slow motion watch it in slow motion because you will see the micro expressions in his face and when he's first asked to take his shirt off you can see this the, the second of fury and rage and and kind of like a fuck off no way right yeah yeah which immediately turns into kind of a bashful like oh shame shame faced boy like oh i guess i have to because of the power differential and i, I know it kind of took us off piece but i just found that so interesting that you actually see the moment of exploitation there you see the tell you see the natural defensive position that any normal person would have and then the complete powerlessness afterwards which is just a really really painful painful moment mm -hmm. I also found it quite interesting that, you know, even although representation, particularly around around queer men, ha has started to change a lot. But for, for decades, we have followed that kind of narrative of the young, smooth, twink type body and, and person. So we've continued that line from, as you were saying earlier, you from the early from the 19th, 20th century, haven't we really? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's interesting arguments about why perhaps somehow have changed that sort of has changed over the years. I mean, it's not always the case. If you look to the seventies, within sort of mainstream gay culture, you always have the clones and, and a type of masculinity that's really um, uh, pushed forwards then. And then twinks sort of coming in in the nineties as a, as a model. And there's some quite strong and interesting, compelling arguments about that being actually um, a reflection of um, people's anxieties around HIV AIDS crisis at the time um, and the, the the sort of return then to like more muscular physiques being um, about an obsession with with healthiness I guess um, but I think um, I think to an extent I think um, perhaps that's also a reflection of um, who gets to write these books that the power differential is um, you know reflected in this these 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 bourgeois men who are quite rich and powerful, um, and the, them as these as the as the subject to these boys' object. They're the ones who look and describe, and they are. I mean, this is the structure of a bourgeois novel in the in the first place. It's about the interior subjectivity of the narrator, the one person who looks and interprets on behalf of the reader and explains. And so that's already quite a consuming view. So it makes sense that in in, in someone like Man that that would be so all encompassing. Um, but I, I also have to have to say, like, I think also there's a perhaps an obsession with youth and power and um, innocence and stuff that isn't just um, limited to, to gay male culture. Mm. I thought it's quite interesting having uh, watching this and then comparing it to Stanley Kubrick's Lolita and its relationship to the, the Nabok Nabokov book Lolita as well. Um, and you see similar dynamics and also similar misuse of the text. Um, uh, yeah, the, the book Lolita is... Um, extremely critical and uses this idea of the observer um, and, and the bourgeois narrator being the one who gets to tell the story. And Nabokov undermines that by having constantly throughout the book all these moments where you re you as the reader are realising what the narrator doesn't realise, which is that this is a terribly abusive relationship which is damaging the, the child. And then when that gets produced into Lolita the film, a lot of those things are completely erased and actually you see this emergence of this Lolita stereotype um, more generally, which is 
the idea that Lolita is a girl who seduces a man, which is the exact opposite point of the book, but has been sort of taken over that narrative entirely. And I think there's, there's similar things here, although I don't think man is anywhere near as critical about his own desire in that way. But I don't think it's a necessarily um, a homosexual thing. I think no. it's to do with male power more than specifically the sexuality of the observer. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Thank you both very much. So we are now going to take a short break. Uh, we'll be right back. שם משפחה מקורי הוא לנגר, זה לא עבד בשבילי לנגר. אגסי. That's the name. ג'ונתון became the star of an incredibly successful production in gay porn history. פעם עכשיו סטטוס, ג'ונתון אגסי סייד מייליי. הוא מבחינתי דמות שמתי שאני צריך, משתלטת עליי ועוזרת לי. הוא תמיד יותר. אני הגבר שלך. אתה הגבר שלי, אבל אתה גם הילד שלי. זה יפה, זה יפה. זה יפה, זה מדהים. אני אוהב אותך, אמא. אני נורא 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 רוצה לאכזב אנשים. בן אדם שנכנס עם ג'ונתן אגסי למיטה, מצפה להיכנס למיטה עם אלוהים. פעם היה איזה מישהו שהוא אמר שאני מרים מול ראש של העולם הזה. אז כאילו הלוואי שזה יסתיים ככה, שכולם רואים אותה כאגדה. Okay, welcome back. So we've got another clip for you and uh, then we'll get back to our final couple of questions. Please make sure that if you have any questions or comments to pop them into the chat and we will have an opportunity to look at those uh, towards the end. So we've got one more clip for you now. När jag tittar på den inspelningen från den audition han gjorde för Döden av Venedig, den gör ont. Jag kan hantera hur det blev och vem han är idag. Men när det finns på film det här avgörande ögonblicket och när jag såg hur obekväm han är och med det som jag vet som andra som tittar inte vet i vem han är i hans personlighet vi pratar om en otroligt känslig pojke jätteblyg som inte ens vill vara där och så ska han plötsligt posera utan tröja och jag vet att nakenhet för honom är inte han vill inte vara naken han vill inte ta av sig kläderna den gjorde ont att se där vill jag åka tillbaka i tiden. Vad, vad håller du på till hans mormor? Lägg av. Låt grabben vara. Det är inte rätt man gör inte som barn. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, I'm finding really interesting is we are now living in a time where we're looking back through a very, very different lens. And so when his daughter is saying that you wouldn't do that now, it is child abuse. How do you, and I'm going to you, Aaron, I mean, how, 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 how do you think, let me get, rephrase that, looking back to some of these incidents that happened in the past through the lens of the 21st century, is that a right thing to be doing? There's kind of, in, in some ways, I think that there's, there's no choice. If you're going to be put in a position of being made a celebrity, if you're going to be put on film, you're going to be objectified. So either you kind of decide around issues of consent that, you know, no longer do we have, you know, people who aren't able to make consent be in films. And then, of course, we have to take away the Olympics and that sort of thing, because the same thing is happening with uh, young athletes and gymnasts and that whole sort of thing or we we bring a knowledge to it which i do feel like is in the cultural ether a bit more like things just seem to be more except unacceptable today that were acceptable then and people 
you know, people are are stepping in a little bit more though I still think it's it's happening. I think the question from that clip is like, where was the guardianship? Where was somebody, where was the parent? Where was the parenting? You know, if it wasn't the grandmother, was it somewhere? It was completely empty. And there's probably a lot of box ticking guardianship and safety issues that go on in these situations now that don't actually really fix the problem. But I think people kind of know better. I'm not sure if that's going to stop people from being objectified and damaged through celebrity though. Mm -hmm. For a wish-washy answer for you there, Mark. <laughs> It, it was a big question. And, and Hugh, do you think we've, how much further do you think we've come from that time? So I, when I was preparing for this, I was, I was thinking about Queer as Folk, which comes out in the late 90s and that, that really famous scene in the really beginning with Charlie and Aidan, the actors, and you've got a 15-year-old schoolboy and a grown man in his early 30s. Have we moved on? Um... Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, I think maybe there's a difference in queer of queer as folk as I mean, I can't speak to the casting or the safeguarding on queer as folk as, as folk, as far as I'm aware, that there doesn't seem, seem to have been a pro, been a problem there. In the same way, I don't think that he I've not I've not heard that he feels that he was exploited in the same way that Bjorn clearly was. I mean, part of it is how do you represent actual lives? You know, like what was happening in queer as folk was representation of actually how I don't know. Um, people did form perhaps relationships like uh, th he's a similar age to me I think the main character when it was released and that those kind of were the sort of relationships that were possible and were happening and that, that now people are much more wary of and people protect young people hopefully more more of but you still have to reflect those as stories that happened you can't write out the idea that you can't tell certain stories that's I think quite different from what's happening in this which is the problem isn't necessarily the representation of the character of Tadzio on screen, although that comes with its own complications, the story that this film tells is the representation of, or the, the treatment of Bjorn as a real human being, as an actor and as a child. Mm -hmm. And um, that story is when he's is as kind of mod as dark, perhaps as the as as the original story, because um, you get to see the consequences, as I said before, of 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 that sort of objectification. And um, I feel. I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I feel in some ways that there were perhaps there's perhaps more went on than even was uh, explicitly said in the film. There was stuff that was hinted at um, that was perhaps he didn't want to talk about, mm. um, which fair enough. I think that's his right. I, 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 I watched it and thought, I feel like there's something missing in this film. And I felt something prurient in myself saying like, I want to know what happened. And I was like, oh, this is a continuation of the same process of him being exploited for film. And I thought it was quite nice, actually, that the filmmakers in this instance, um, Lindstrom and Petrie, actually, I think, probably purposefully held something back for him, uh, that he that he had, in some way, some control over his own story now, which he didn't clearly in the in the production of, um, of Death in Venice. And we've spoken... Thank you, Hugh. And we've spoken a lot about kind of the, some of those... The stuff that's gone on and how it relates to to queer men and, and our history. What I'm also interested in, Aaron, is is the theme that runs through it around around loss. And I should have said at the beginning, if you've not seen the documentary, there are some spoilers. Um, but uh, Bjorn does suffer some losses, but there's also redemption at the end and, and finding himself as well. Did you see that throughout the film? I have. I, I did kind of see the push the push and pull of those elements. I, I didn't quite feel, I don't know, redemption. I, I, like it was a seeking for closure, I felt, not oh. redemption, but I'm not sure if he got that, sadly. And, and we don't always get that. And in fact, a lot of the time we don't get that. And sometimes a kind of a closure is accepting what we can't understand, which I think happens a little bit around his father there, which is another open-ended story that leaves us kind of feeling curious. But I think in the sense that you can show how somebody can carry on without having complete closure, the film also does a really good job of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I thought it was interesting that he was... Um allowed it to portray himself not 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 entirely as a victim but as a, but as a survivor as well and that there was a moment towards the end which was i think probably as close as you'd get to closure where he his i think his daughter sort of says that he she, she wishes that he could sort of see that he he was um what he survived that actually you know that that 
he, he got, he's got through it. And he says at one point that one of the things that he's learned, which is uh, a sad, but I think probably true realization is that um, uh, he's lost so much um, and been through so much that actually he can get through quite a lot because he said, well, it's just one more thing to lose. Mm-hmm. I actually felt that him, and maybe I'm, I'm misremembering it, but I actually felt that him going through the process of the documentary seemed cathartic. Cause you know, we open up with that absolute disastrous, stuff with his girlfriend that he's living with, the house of the mess, the landlady's coming to kick him out and all the rest of it. And by the end of it, you know, he seems to have pulled things together. So it seems that that reflection and looking back as painful as it was, has taken him to a different place. I think it's having a voice there. Because I, I think you both, both Mark and you, you've, you've, you've spoken about having a voice. And I think that the, the film gave this guy an opportunity to tell his side of the story and to make sense of it which I imagine you know it's what you do in therapy it seems like a therapeutic process in order to do that and it does feel like I would say for me it's like there's a reclamation going on on and also an acceptance of the damage that isn't isn't going to get any better it's like you have both things sitting sitting next to each other all right so um we are now going to thank you both very much for asking my questions, <laughs> answering my questions, I should say. Um, so we've got some questions for the audience, from the audience. And the first one is uh, from Ralph. Um, do you think this could happen today? And I'm not going to assume exactly, but I, I'm going to lean into, yeah, do you think this could happen today? Um, I, I think it is happening today. I'm sure it's happening today. Um, stuff like the... Um... Uh, Harvey Harvey Weinstein uh, uh, case shows exactly that this is happening today, and the amount of me- money that's still involved in in film and the pressures um, and the discrepancy between the amount of power that people have who have the ability to make films, the kingmakers like like Harvey Weinstein and the uh, the people who really want to sort of make their way into it, creates just so many spaces for for this sort of abuse. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, like I think this is a um, something that, that filmmaking lends itself to uh, on when uh, at, its, at its largest scale. Aaron? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think also this year we got the news that the the two actors that were in the ninth, I think, nineteen sixty eight uh, film Romeo and Juliet has sued yeah. Paramount Pictures. Like, what fifty some years later, um, because it's like coming to consciousness <clears throat> that this was this was not okay. This was an abusive situation, which legally, you know, presumably will set a precedent and which will require people to be more careful in a sense. But you know, legalities don't stop um, harms from happening, and it's not always um, it's not always about consent either. A lot of the time, we go into something because we think we want something or we think we're consenting to something and we don't quite know what we're getting involved in and then still end up in trouble. So it's a very tricky thing to fix. So yeah, I think we're going to be stuck grappling with that one for quite some time. Okay. Thank you both. So next question, I'm going to come straight to you, Aaron, because of the work that I know that you've done around social media. Um, So what, what, what does the panel think of social media influencers who base their content around the family is there a way to participate with the, with the world socially while preserving a sense of privacy? Well, you know, I could probably talk for hours on this one, but I'm going to keep it really, really brief. The problem with social media in general, not just around issues around the family, is that it gives everybody the opportunity to experience the same harms of celebrity that was only reserved for <laughs> celebrities before. And what's really pernicious about the social media situation, like celebrity, is when you do it well, when you get the points, the likes, the follows for whatever it is that you're producing, it encourages you to, you to keep producing the same stuff, which might be pulling you further and further away from your true self, to use a really crass word because of a lack of time, I'd use a different word generally. Um, and the only fix to that is is to not identify your your social media persona as who you are and to really see it as a performance and as a production and making sure that your real important relationships are happening outside of that world and that you're expressing all sorts of different levels of creativity that are just about what gets you the points on TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is. Right, thanks. Hugh, I'm gonna to come to you with this one. We, we, we sort of touched on this a little bit, um, but does gay culture objectify youth? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think, yes. <laughs> <It's a> short <laughs> answer. It, of course it does. Um, uh, not not uh, uniquely, as I said before. I think um, uh, neither, neither also in sexualizing youth, I think, is not also unique to gay culture. Um, but I think, um, well, I think I actually... The, the original book uh, death in venice is kind of is kind of a um a muse on this which is that uh, the, the youth is uh used in it as a sort of foil for man to think also about his own death and um uh the, this figure of the young younger man as the angel of death precipitating ashenbach's spoiler alert ashenbach's <laughs> final death at the end of the book because he becomes obsessed with the boy the boy's youth um, I think is kind of um, what man was really thinking about, which is um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the collapse of his own sort of youth, I guess, as, and, and his own approach to death. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's an obvious answer, which is to do with, you know, um, you, you could say to do with, you know, gay men getting older and maybe not having families to focus on and become obsessed with. But I think that's a, I, don't, I think that's dated now and was always probably a bit of a cliche in the first place. Um, I think it's a more u- universal aspect of, of aging. Um, I think what's also interesting in, with man as well is that he was becoming a father at the time when he wrote the book and um, uh, later would go on to have like very complex um, and um, probably quite abusive or I don't know, very difficult feelings he had towards his own sons um, and the, 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 the effect of um, that upon his son Klaus especially, who ends up taking his life quite young as a result. Um, so, so yeah, I do think, of course, like there's a strong aspect of um, gay culture that is obsessed with with youth and aging and defying aging. But I think that's probably a result of the human condition rather than anything specifically to do with gay men. Yeah, yeah. I suppose when we live in this little kind of bubble of the world, we kind of experience it and we amplify it a bit. So I think we've got time for probably maybe one maybe two more questions. Um, I'll read this out. I love the ending of the documentary where the film cuts back and forth between Bjorn looking out to the sea and Tadzio looking back from the sea. I love, I love the juxtaposition between both real and fake, past and present. How does the panel view this ending? Aaron, I'll go to you first. It's, if I recall correctly, it's also the ending of the book and of the film, right? That, um, the old man Aschenbach is looking at Tadzio as he walks out into the sea and like looks <laughs> looks over his shoulder back at him. Um, and I, th- I think, uh, like you said, Hugh, this is this is a fundamental part of the human condition that you know. And it's actually it's a great it's a great book to read when you're younger and when you're older because when you read this book when you're younger, you identify with Tadzio, and when you read the book when you're older, you identify with Aschenbach. And when you read the book younger and identify with Tadzio, you never, ever, ever think you're going to be reading it, identifying with Aschenbach until you're old enough to identify with Aschenbach. And then you're like, oh my God, you know, here I am. I'm the old guy in it. So again, it's not not just a gay thing. That is a thing about coming to terms with one's aging, coming to terms with one's mortality and all of the fantasy we have imbued in our own youth that we're projecting elsewhere. And I think that echo in that last scene is echoing what Thomas Mann is saying and in the film and and in the documentary again. And Hugh, over to you for the last answer. Yeah, what Aaron just said about projection is is really what's happening in the book and in the film. uh, And uh, I think what the documentary manages to to, to free him from, that that Tadzio and also Bjorn, Tadzio for, for, for Aschenbach becomes this figure into, he doesn't really know anything about Tadzio at all, but he can project all sorts of his own fantasies and about who this person is and what he means to to to, to, um, to Aschenbach. But but for for Tadzio, from his perspective, Aschenbach is just some guy who's floating around his hotel. And then with the with the film, you really see exactly the same, which is this um, uh, Bjorn being sort of forced into silence by by Visconti and just becoming a a foil, like a, a projection screen, like a cinema screen, in which he can just project all these images that he wants about youth and beauty, et cetera, et cetera, uh, onto this boy who has no say and is clearly actually going through his own th- very complex thing. And um, uh, I thought it was quite interesting as well, one of the things that they, they said about how he, um, uh, how he as, a, as, a, as, a, as an actor seemed to have a darkness about him. They kept saying all the whole time, and this was something that they found very attractive rather than something that they felt 
they have no sense they should actually inquire what that darkness might be about. Like he just lost his mother, uh, for example. Um, and I think what's nice about the end of the film is that in in the in uh, in the original film in Death in Venice, he's sort of calling Tadzio is almost calling to him, and he he's too ill. He can't get out, Ashen back. Can't get out of his seat, and he dies sort of on the on the spot. And it's this this like. Um, the desire, the urge is sort of wilting within him. Whereas in the, the, the ending of the film, suddenly, uh, uh, finally, I think um, Bjorn becomes the the uh, the subject of the documentary, the subject of the story, rather than just this object onto whom other things are projected. Cool. Well, that is a great way to end that. So thank you both very much for uh answering all those great questions and taking time to view the film and to reread the book and to sit through Death in Venice again. Um, I'm really <laughs> glad that you, you did that and you enjoyed the documentary. So thank you, Hugh, and thank you, Aaron, for, for your time this evening. Um, that is it from us. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to the BFI for their continued support of The Social Club for the second season of The Sofa Club. Our next show is on the film Lonesome, and we'll be, we will be joined by the director Craig Borum and the cast. So look out for that on the Peccadillo social media channels, and we'll make an announcement of when that is. So thank you so much. Wherever you are, have a great evening and a great day. Take care. Night boys like you, being on your own, you like it that way. What brings you to Sydney? There was this guy I was seeing. He was married, had a young family. Someone saw us. It's not like you. I just took off.